My name is Stephen Sindoni. Thank you for listening to the Hollow Earth Revealed. As a direct result of my research on the legend of J.C. Brown, I stumbled upon many ancient myths and native legends regarding the origin of man. Mount Shasta is called by many the Magic Mountain. I will now share with you information that I have collected. It is believed that the great kingdom of Lemuria was located in the Gobi Desert in Mongolia, was destroyed by Atlantis in a great war that led to a cataclysmic destruction of Atlantis and Mu. Mu was a great city on the surface of what is now the Gobi Desert. It had two satellite cities by the name of Agartha Alpha and Beta that survived the destruction. These elder races came to this planet from another solar system in our prehistoric past. After a time living on the surface, they realized our sun was causing them to age prematurely. So they escaped underground, building huge subterranean complexes in which to live. In Buddhist theory, it is believed that a race of supermen and superwomen occasionally came up to the surface to oversee the development of the human race. It is believed that this subterranean world has millions of inhabitants and many cities, its capital being Shambhala. Ancient philosophy states that Agartha was first colonized thousands of years ago when a holy man led a tribe to the underground. Hindu theory describes in the Ramanya, one of the most famous texts of India, a story about the great avatar Rama. It describes Rama as an emissary from Agartha who arrived in an air vehicle. According to this legend, the deep dwellers are described as a very advanced race or species with a highly developed technology. In Tibet, there is a magical mystical shrine called Patala, which is said by the people that the shrine sits atop of an ancient cavern and tunnel system which reaches throughout the Asian continent and possibly beyond. Hopi legend says that Mount Shasta is one of the 13 homes of the lizard people reptoids. Native American Indian tribes of California claim that Mount Shasta is the inner mountain dwelling place of an invisible race of man. Still many more accounts describe the mountain as an inlet to the ancient Lemurian world and that the Lemurian survivors still live today in the tunnels of dead volcanoes. The most remarkable stories are the ones about Lemurians living in roundhouses and enjoying unlimited health and wealth and true brotherhood. The Lemurians living underground beneath the mountain are commonly described as graceful and tall, seven feet and up with long flowing hair. They dress in white robes and sandals, but they have also been seen in colorful clothing. They have evolved their sixth sense, which enables them to communicate among themselves by extrasensory perception. They can also teleport and make themselves invisible at will. The Lemurians supposedly have mastered atomic energy, telepathic and clairvoyant skills, electronics, and science as long as 18,000 years ago. Back then, they knew how to propel boats using energy radiated from crystals. They had airships and flew them to Atlantis and Mu and other places. Today it is said they have a whole fleet of spaceships called the Silver Fleet with which they come in and out of the mountain and go into space. They also have the ability to make their spaceships invisible and soundless to avoid being detected by the local and national military. Though they are third dimensional people in nature, they are able to shift their energy field into fourth and fifth dimension and become invisible at will within seconds. Many people report seeing strange lights on the mountain. One explanation is that there are spacecrafts coming and going from a spaceport within the mountain. Mount Shasta is not only a home for the Lemurians, but is also an interplanetary and intergalactical multidimensional portal. Thank you for tuning into the broadcast of The Secrets of the Hollow Earth. In today's program, I will share a little known story that happened in 1893 and is still a mystery today. It is the case of the sailing vessel Gladys, captained by F.B. Hadfield. The captain wrote in the ship's log that the vessel was completely surrounded by icebergs at 43 degrees south 
and 33 degrees west. At this latitude an iceberg was observed which bore a large quantity of sand and earth and which revealed a beaten track, a place of refuge formed in a sheltered nook, and the bodies of five dead men who lay on different parts of the berg. Bad weather prevented any attempts at further investigation. A unanimous consensus of opinion among scientists is that one thing peculiar to the Antarctic is that there are no human tribes living upon it. Also, investigations showed that no vessel was lost in the Antarctic at the time, so that these men could not be shipwrecked sailors. Had these men ventured out of their warm, habitable land and lost their way along the ice shelf finally to be drifted to their deaths at sea on a portion of land that broke away to become an iceberg while they were on it? Could it be that these men who died on the iceberg came from that mysterious land beyond the South Pole discovered by Admiral Byrd's expedition? Then in February of 1947, Another remarkable discovery was made in the continent of Antarctica, the discovery of Bunger's Oasis. This discovery was made by Lieutenant Commander David Bunger, who was at the controls of one of six large transport planes used by Admiral Byrd for the U.S. Navy's Operation High Jump in 1946 through 1947. Bunger was flying inland from the Shackleton Ice Shelf near Queen Mary coast of Wolfsland. He and his crew were about four miles from the coastline where open water lies. The land Bunger discovered was ice free. The lakes were of many different colors ranging from rusty red green to deep blue. Each of the lakes was more than three miles long. The water was warmer than the ocean as Bunger found by landing a seaplane on one of the lakes. Each lake had a gently sloping beach around the four edges of the oasis which was roughly square in shape. Bunger saw endless and eternal white snow and ice. Two sides of the oasis rose nearly a hundred feet high and consisted of great ice walls. The other two sides had a more gradual and gentle slope. The existence of such an oasis in the far Antarctic, a land of perpetual ice, would indicate warmer conditions there which would exist if the oasis was in the South Pole opening, leading to the warmer interior of the earth, as was the case with the warmer territory with land of lakes that Admiral Byrd discovered beyond the North Pole, which was probably within the North Polar opening. Otherwise, one cannot explain the existence of such an oasis of unfrozen territory in the midst of the continent of Antarctica with ice miles thick. The oasis could not result from volcanic activity below the Earth's surface since the land area of the oasis covered 300 square miles. It was too big to be affected by volcanic heat supply. Warm wind currents from the Earth's interior are a better explanation. Thus, Bert in the Arctic and Bunger in the Antarctic both made similar discoveries of warmer land areas beyond the poles at about the same time early in 1947. But they were not the only ones to make such a discovery. Some time ago, a newspaper in Toronto, Canada, the Globe and Mail, published a photo of a green valley taken by an aviator in the Arctic region. Eventually, the aviator took the picture from the air and did not attempt to land. It was a beautiful valley and contained rolling green hills. The aviator must have gone beyond the North Pole which lies inside the polar opening. This picture was published in 1960. In further confirmation are reports of individuals who claimed they had entered the North Polar opening as many Arctic explorers did without knowing that they did and penetrated far enough into it to reach the subterranean world in the hollow interior of the earth. What is it that exists at both poles of the earth which opens to us new frontiers so vast in extent and nature as to be beyond present understanding? It may be that exploration of space is far less important than the explanation of our own mysterious planet which has now suddenly become a vast realm far larger than we ever dreamed it to be. How do scientists explain the fact that when we go north it becomes colder up to a certain point and then begins to get warm? How do they explain the further fact that the source of this warmth is not any influence from the south but a series of current of warm water of warm winds from the north supposed to be a land of solid ice? Where can these currents come from? How could they come from anything else but an open sea? And why should they be a warm water open sea at the very place where scientists expect to find eternal ice? Where could this warmer water possibly come from? 
If no rivers are flowing from the inside to the outside, then why are all icebergs composed of fresh water? Why does one find tropical seeds, plants, and trees floating in the fresh water of these icebergs? If the inside of the earth is not warm, why do millions of tropical birds and animals go further north in the winter time? And what produces the aurora borealis? And lastly, why is our government and military leaders, in view of Lieutenant Bunger and Admiral Byrd's eyewitness testimony and accounts, afraid to openly discuss it? Could it be that to discuss it would be to admit that the truth has been suppressed? It is my belief that this new world could be more easily reached than the moon and is of much more importance to us since it provides ideal conditions for human life with a better climate than even exists on the surface. The answer to solving the mystery may be as easy as using a tracking device on many of the birds and other animals that migrate in winter seeking a warmer environment. And one of the ways to accomplish this would be to put a tracking device and a camera on the Ross Gull, common at Point Barrow, who migrate in October toward the north. And we can also use these same tracking devices and surveillance cameras on the mutton birds of Australia which leave that continent in September because no one has ever been able to find out where they go. With the use of a tracking device and an embedded video camera we will now be able to discover if these birds pass into the exterior of the earth via the South Pole or the North Pole. And there are other animals that we can track in the winter such as the auk which leaves to go north as winter approaches. It is my hope that an independent group of free thinkers and unbought scientists take a closer look into the secrets of the polar openings. I'd like to thank everyone for watching Secrets of the Hollow Earth. <laughs>
and flowing toward the outside through the polar openings freeze at their mouth and form mountains of freshwater ice whose presence in this region would be inexplicable if the earth was a solid sphere. In summertime, huge icebergs miles long break off and float to the outside of the earth. And here is my next argument. These icebergs are composed of fresh water when there could exist only salt water at the poles. Since this is the case, and since all water on the outside of the earth in these regions is salty, the fresh water of which these icebergs are composed must come from its interior. And inside the icebergs, mammoths and other huge tropical animals believed to be of prehistoric origin because they have never been seen on the earth's surface have been found in a perfect state of preservation. Some of them have been found to have green vegetation in their mouths and stomachs at the time they were suddenly frozen. And they were the observations of Admiral Byrd of a huge mammoth-like creature in what he described in The Land Beyond the Pole, which he discovered. I asked the question, could the mammoths be really animals now inhabiting the interior of the earth, which have been carried to the surface by rivers and frozen inside of the ice that form when the rivers reach the surface forming glaciers and icebergs. Many polar explorers not only mention animals but also flora vegetation in the extreme north. Also many animals like the muskox strangely migrate northward in winter which it would only do if it reached a warmer land there. And repeatedly Arctic explorers have observed bears heading northward into an area where there cannot be food for them if there was no polar openings into a warmer region. Foxes also were found north of the 80th parallel heading north, obviously well fed. Without exception, Arctic explorers agree that, strangely, the further north one gets after a certain latitude, the warmer it gets. Invariably, a north wind brings warmer weather. Conifera's trees were found drifting ashore coming from the far north. Butterflies and bees were found in the far north and even mosquitoes, but they are not found hundreds of miles to the south and not until Canadian and Alaskan climate areas conducive to such insect life are reached. Unknown varieties of flowers were also found in the extreme north. Birds resembling snipe, but unlike any known species of bird, were seen to come from the north and to return there. Eskimo tribes have left unmistakable traces of their migration by their temporary camps, always advancing northward. Southern Eskimos speak of tribes that live in the far north. The Eskimos hold the belief that their ancestors came from a land of paradise in the extreme north. At a July 17, 1996 news conference, the findings were announced by Columbia University scientists describing the situation. Earth's interior is in a spin as being virtually a planet within a planet. The outer planet is called Earth. The fastest spinning inner core is solid yet extremely hot iron, just a bit smaller than the moon. The Columbia University scientists stated that the inner core was moving quickly enough between 0.4 and 1.8 degrees annually to once every four centuries which would make it one further lap ahead of the Earth's surface. Such a condition is not known for any other planet or rocky body in the universe. Our planet's special quality was discovered when tracking of seismic waves showed unexpected patterns. The hollow earth theory has so far remained just a theory to the public. But for those who have been there, their stories cannot be denied and their extraordinary experiences that so far cannot be explained which points to something strange happening there. Is the earth hollow? It is my belief that the answer will be revealed in a not too distant future, shattering the existing unrealistic paradigm. Thanks for watching The Earth is Hollow. Thank you for tuning into the broadcast of Eskimo Legends Fact or Fiction. In today's program, I will share with you an interesting story as it relates to the ancient history of the Eskimo who live in the far north. 
William F. Warren, in his book Paradise Found, The Cradle of the Human Race, presents the view that the human race originated in a tropical continent in the Arctic, the famed Hyperborea of the ancient Greeks, a land of sunshine and fruits, whose inhabitants, a race of gods, lived for over a thousand years without growing old. The ancient writings of the Chinese, Egyptians, Hindus, and other races, and the legends of the Eskimos, speak of a great opening in the north and a race that lives under the earth's crust and that their ancestors came from this paradisical land in the earth's interior. Most writers on this subject claim that the interior of the earth is inhabited by a race of small brown skinned people and also that the Eskimos, whose racial origin differ from that of all other races on the earth's surface, came from this subterranean race. When the Eskimos were asked where their forefathers came from, they pointed to the north. Some Eskimo legends tell of a paradisical land of great beauty to the north. Eskimo legends also tells of a beautiful land of perpetual light where there is neither darkness at any time nor a too bright sun. This wonderful land has a mild climate where large lakes never freeze, where tropical animals roam in herds, and where birds of many colors cloud the sky, a land of perpetual youth where people live for thousands of years in peace and happiness. There is a story of a British king named Herla whom the Skraelings, Eskimos, took to a land of paradise beneath the earth. The Irish have a legend about a lovely land beyond the north where are continuous light and summer weather. And Scandinavian legends tell of a wonderful land far to the north called Ultima Thule. Many early legends tell of people going under the earth into a strange realm, staying there for a long period of time, and later returning. They even thought that some of their heroes had gone there and returned, after which they were never satisfied with their own country. Naturally, the Eskimos do not know that the earth is hollow and that ages ago they lived in its interior, but they have clung to that one simple fact, they came from the north. As for the land of perpetual sunshine, the Eskimo, of course, does not remember that as something he himself has seen, for it is very questionable if any of the Eskimos of the present generation have ever penetrated to the interior. But it is a well-known fact that every race has its idea of a golden age or paradise, which is generally composed of the elements being handed down in its stories and myths, or being characteristic of its earliest home. Thus, the Eskimo legends handed down generation after generation tales of the interior land with its ever-shining sun, and what could be more natural than when the Eskimo came to build in fancy a paradise for himself and his loved ones after they should die, that he should reconstruct his first home of what he had heard only in dim legends. An Eskimo discussing their religion says they believe in a future world and that the soul descends beneath the earth into various abodes, the first of which is somewhat in the nature of a purgatory, but the good spirits passing through it find that the other mansions improve till a great depth they reach that of perfect bliss. It is a place where the sun never sets, and where by the side of great lakes they never freeze, the deer roam in large herds, and the seal and the walrus always abound in the waters. That paradise might serve as almost a literal description of the land in the interior of the earth and the way in which the Eskimo indicates a preliminary purgatory before it can be reached may be the reflection of a memory handed down in the tribe of the great hardships and difficulties of the ice barrier between that wonderful home and the present situation of the Eskimo on the southern side of that great natural obstacle. It is also interesting to note that when the Eskimo saw explore Robert Peary's effort to get further north than the great ice cap of Greenland, beyond which they themselves had no ambition to explore, they immediately thought that the reason for his trying to get further north was to get into communication with other tribes there. That idea would hardly have occurred to them if it were not for the fact they had traditional or other evidence of people in the supposedly unpopulated north. Is there a paradise in the far north, as Eskimo legends suggest? Hopefully this question will be answered in the not too distant future. Thank you for watching Eskimo Legends Fact or Fiction.
today's program, I would like to share with you one of the most outstanding mysteries ever published. The original article was published in Popular Science Monthly by the editors Sumner and Blossom in December of 1923. The exclusive story was given by United States Navy Lieutenant Commander Fitzhugh Green. The Navy was planning a transpolar flight of the huge new dirigible, the ZR-1, the Shenandoah, next summer. Here lies the most thrilling possibility that ever faced a single body of explorers. In the center of the unknown area of the polar sea may be discovered a vast continent heated by subterranean fires and inhabited by the descendants of the last Norwegian colony of Greenland. So wild is the idea as to tax the gullible imagination, yet it is vividly encouraged and supported not only by history and tradition, but by the searching test of scientific analysis. Witness the astounding facts. Within boundaries of the polar sea spreads the greatest unexplored area on the surface of the globe. One million square miles on which no human eye has gazed. Most of this enormous wilderness lies on the Alaskan side of the pole. On the European side lies Iceland at a point corresponding roughly to the center of the unknown area opposite it across the top of the world. This fact is significant. Experts are in nearly unanimous agreement that a new Arctic land will be found by the ZR-1. Dr. Harris, the title expert in Washington, D.C., long ago declared that the data he had worked out from polar ocean currents all convinced him that the existence of a large landmass near the North Pole is undisputable. Add to this the array of evidence geologists adduce on the basis of terrific volcanic activity along a well-defined line leading up the North Pacific through the Japanese archipelago and the fiery Aleutians and onward toward the pole. This seismic axis plotted on the globe nearly bisects the unknown area of the polar ocean. Further, where this line swung through 180 degrees, it would touch Iceland, one of the most fiercely volcanic spots on Earth. Another significant fact, not many years ago, in a particular open season, the American whaler Captain Keenan reported he saw a land northeast of Point Barrow. Peary from Cape Thomas Hubbard sighted distant peaks northwest. Such evidence is incontrovertible. The new continent seems already within our grasp, which leads us to its probable inhabitants. Eric the Red discovered Greenland in 985 AD. He brought back glowing tales of grassy fjords, long sunlit days, game infested hills, ice pans grooming under their burden of fat seals, and bays teeming with fish. Colonization began at once, and so true did Eric's bright tale prove that the Vikings greatly prospered. In the archives at Bergen may be seen today the receipts for their princely contributions in ivory and oil to the ill-fated crusaders. The last ship known to have returned to Norway from her Arctic colonies arrived in the year 1410. We read that it brought a rich cargo that its report was of happy thriving Norsemen back north of health and growing independence despite their rigorous environment. The dark ages had now passed. Nature bred again in men the will to search her world for knowledge and for wealth. Greenland was rediscovered. Hans Agede established the first modern settlement there in 1721. But the grim report he made was tragic beyond belief. The Norwegian colony, 10,000 people, perhaps 100,000, had to a man mysteriously disappeared. It was the greatest riddle in the history of the world. It has been called the baffling mystery of the lost Norse colony. Where did they go? Let us examine where they didn't go. This is a question that can be more easily answered not to sea in ships, for they had one or two ships. And Greenland lying above the tree line gave them no timber for building more. Not slain by Eskimos, for Eskimos are the most peace-loving people in the world, knowing nothing of the art of war. Not like Europe swept by some dread germ of awful virulence, 
for germs don't thrive in polar regions. So what then? Now let's examine the Eskimo tradition. It paints in vivid terms the white men swarming suddenly north to a wonderland the natives long had known. Because of evil spirits, no Eskimo had ever dared this trail. The land is warm, is clothed in summer verdure the year round, is populated by fat caribou and muskox. It lies, they say, even to this day in the direction of the coastal trail route north. This route is that taken by our American expeditions. Perry, Kane, and Hayes all used it. It has always been the most easiest route as well and the most productive of natural food in seal and walrus. For our explorers it has been a hard trail, but for the Norwegian colonists whose forebears had spent ten generations north of the Arctic Circle it must have been less difficult to travel than were the western plains for our American pioneers. Lord Northward picture the terrible situation in which the deserted Norsemen in Greenland found themselves. No outlet for their trade, no source of supply for the little but indispensable luxuries of life, no access to friends and family back home. A generation, perhaps two, of heartbreak or longing and unhappiness goading the younger men to travel northward. Perhaps a route to southern lands lay that way. Suddenly, like a bombshell breaks upon the weary colony, the wonderful news, we found a polar paradise. Sunshine, game, grass, one moon's easy journey north, a short lap on the ice sea. Come! What had they to wait for? The homeland was but a myth. So they packed and singing songs departed, the native legend puts it, suddenly to the northward. They never returned. The fact is not at all surprising of what we think is true that they found the land of milk and honey in the very center of the polar pack. Is there a polar paradise? And if so, are the vanished Norsemen there? It is no speculation of wild improbability to picture a polar paradise like some titan emerald in its alabaster setting. And could this explain why birds fly north in this area to escape the cold in winter? It does make one wonder. Thank you for watching The Lost Colony. In today's program, we'll examine one of Alaska's great mysteries. Our story is entitled, Northern Lights Revealed. On October 18th in 1867, the United States purchased Alaska from Russia and took control of the Russian-American capital of Sitka. William H. Seward brokered the Alaskan purchase for $7.2 million. Indigenous Alaskans were confused by the recent land transaction and justifiably wary of American soldiers. It became quickly apparent that with few exceptions Americans had no desire to colonize this mysterious land with its rugged terrain and harsh climate. Alaska remained relatively unknown until the end of the 19th century when the gold rush lured tens of thousands of prospectors and adventurers to Alaska and the Yukon. As a consequence, small towns sprung up along the trail to supply those hoping to strike gold. Alaska was now billed as a land of opportunity. Alaska with its numerous islands has nearly 34,000 miles of tidal shoreline. It is the largest state in the United States in terms of land area. 570,374 square miles. If you superimpose the map of Alaska on the lower 48 states, Alaska would stretch from Minnesota to Texas and from California to Georgia. The Aurora Borealis or Northern Lights are one of the major attractions that make Alaska a popular travel destination. Although the Aurora Borealis, or Northern Lights, is active all year round, they can only be seen when the Alaskan night sky is dark enough. This usually happens between late August and early April. It may be different in specific regions of Alaska. 
The aurora borealis or northern lights are a phenomenon that is not completely understood. The aurora gets its name from the Roman goddess of dawn. An Eskimo legend describes the lights as flaming torches carried by travelers to the afterlife. On a scientific level, recent research suggests that the aurora is caused by radiation which is emitted as light from atoms in the upper atmosphere as they are hit by swiftly moving electrons and protons. The type of atom determines the color. And then there are those who believe, including myself, that the aurora is caused by radiation which is emitted as a light from atoms in the inner earth atmosphere by a central sun in the hollows of the earth. Could this be the reason why commercial flights are not allowed to fly directly over the North Pole? It does make one wonder. Hopefully we'll have the answer to these mysterious Northern Lights. Thank you for tuning into the broadcast of Northern Lights Revealed. In today's program we will examine one of Antarctica's Great Mysteries, our story is entitled, Southern Lights Revealed. Antarctica is a land of extremes. Antarctica is the coldest, highest, windiest, driest, and iciest continent on Earth. At its coldest, temperatures have been recorded as low as 129 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. Its highest elevation is approximately 8,200 feet. Wind gusts have reached 200 miles per hour on Commonwealth Bay, George V. Coast. Average precipitation is less than 2 inches per year. Its thickest ice can be found on Wilkes Land, where it reaches a depth of 15,669 feet. During the winter, the South Pole is tilted away from the sun 24 hours a day, so it's always dark. The Aurora Australia's southern lights are mesmerizing. Its dynamic displays of light appear in the Antarctic skies in winter. They are in fact nature's light show, visual poetry from the quantum leaps of atmospheric gases. As those who have witnessed the Aurora can attest, few sights can equal the magic and mystery of the luminous sheets of color undulating in the frigid air of Antarctica winter. How high is the aurora? Generally, if an aurora band is easily discernible on its lower border, it will be around 60 to 70 miles in altitude. Aurora rays may extend above the lower border for hundreds of miles. Antarctica consists of two main areas, East Antarctica, Greater Antarctica, and smaller West Antarctica, Lesser Antarctica. Antarctica has one of the largest mountain chains in the world. The Trans-Antarctic Mountains extend from the top of the Antarctic Peninsula to Cape Adair, a distance of 3,000 miles. The mountains rise above the western shore of McMurdo Sound and are considerably older and an entirely different geological origin than the Ross Island volcanoes, which some may argue suggest a cataclysmic event that shifted the landmass in ancient times. To support this theory, there are those who claim that West Antarctica is an extension of the Andes Mountains stretching from South America. It is thought that if the ice sheets were removed from West Antarctica, they would actually be a collection of islands. There are no cities or states in the Antarctic. The only places where people live are bases or stations usually operated by national governments. Seven countries including Australia claim territory in Antarctica. There are those that believe that the Antarctic Treaty that was signed during the Cold War by the United Kingdom, the United States, Belgium, New Zealand, Japan, Russia, Argentina, Norway, Australia, France, Chile, and South Africa will ensure that the secrets to the mysterious lights seen in Antarctica remain a mystery. And where do these mysterious lights come from? Hopefully we'll have the answer to these mysterious southern lights. Thank you for tuning into the broadcast of Southern Lights Revealed.
today's program, Inner Earth Revealed, I will share with you many locations throughout the United States that may have tunnels that lead to the inner earth. We will begin our broadcast by discussing Superstition Mountain. This is an area that needs to be investigated. Legendary Indian Chief Geronimo would be seen walking into the face of the mountain, disappearing and then reappearing in New Mexico. The soldiers who were hell-bent on capturing the elusive Apache chief were mystified as to how he was able to escape the human net surrounding him and his band. Those that claim to have penetrated the tunnel tell of the remains of ancient structures and a spiral staircase that leads forever down into the bowels of the earth. The main entrance to the superstition tunnel system links to numerous tunnel passageways which spider out as far as Central America. And then there is Boynton Canyon in Sedona, Arizona. Unknown machinery has been found in Boynton Canyon in Sedona, Arizona that suggests a technically advanced culture that existed millions of years before. And allegedly entrances to Agartha located on planetary grid points, indwells and outdwells of energy have been found at Monmouth Cave in South Central Kentucky. And in northern Arkansas, a 12-man spellological team broke into an ancient tunnel system encountering inhabitants of the inner world. Just north of Batesville, explorers found a tunnel illuminated by a greenish phosphorescence where they met a race of beings who stood 7 to 8 feet tall and had bluish skin. The beings who had advanced technology told the explorers they are the direct descendants of Noah. The Cherokee Indians also tell of this same race of blue men. According to the Cherokee, they inhabited the area of Kentucky as well. When the Cherokee came into that area, they killed these blue-skinned men off. Apparently, the Cherokee were wrong in their assumptions. California also holds the legend of Crystal Cave, a large cavern that links to Cocoweek Peak. It was reportedly found by Earl Dorr, a miner and prospector who followed clues given to him by Indians. Dorr entered Crystal Cave in the 1930s and followed a passage down to Cocoweef Mountain for about a mile. Here, he entered a large cavern that he explored for a distance of eight miles. Flowing at the base of the cavern was a river and its banks were rich with deposits of gold. For reasons only known to Dorr, he dynamited the entrance. The exact location of this sealed entrance is unknown today. And then there is Mount Lassen. Mount Lassen, located in Tahama County, California, there are people who claim there is an entrance that leads to a large underground city. Near the foot of Mount Lassen is a town called Manton. Ralph Fields claims that he found the entrance on the side of the mountain, a little over 7,000 feet above sea level, and is near a rock that's outcropping on the mountain. And then we have Mount Rainier. It is said that a very active UFO base exists beneath Mount Rainier in Washington State. There are also said to be underground vaults containing records of the ancient Lemurians. The ice cap of Mount Rainier contains a maze of corridors and caves. In August of 1970, scientists climbed to the top of Mount Rainier and entered these caves and tunnels. Evidence was found indicating that a small lake exists deep beneath the ice cap. And finally, Mount Shasta, the Agarthan city of Telos that allegedly exists within and beneath the mountain. And that underground city is the same city that in 1904, J.C. Brown, a prospector for the Lord Cowjay Mining Company, reported that he had discovered while prospecting near Mount Shasta. Is there a hollow earth? Do underground cities exist? I myself have been a witness to strange craft coming out of Mount Adams in Washington. With my own eyes, I have observed UFO activity that defy conventional wisdom. It is my opinion that we are not alone in this universe. The answers to our ancient past may be hidden in the hollow earth.